So I'm going to briefly introduce the projects um, which focused on the politics of building state capacity in Africa and the role of bureaucratic pockets of effectiveness. And then we, each of the speakers in turn will take us through one of the particular cases they looked at uh, before coming back to some broader conclusions and, and opening up for discussion. And hopefully we'll touch on some of the bigger themes we've raised during this whole seminar series, uh, as well as the specifics. Um, so this is a project which is jointly funded by ECID and also a separate grant from the Economic and Social Research Council. Um, and it um, shares a focus with ECID on what's become an increasingly large uh, agenda, um, particularly in academic, but also in policy communities around state capacity returning as a, as a, as a focus for development theory and policy. Uh, that was always there in the original developmental states literature and has now been increasingly accepted as being key to the politics and development agenda over the last 10 years with even AC Mogler and Robinson who previously only stressed the inclusive and liberal nature of institutions also now accepting that strong states are a part of the story going forward. Within that focus on state capacity we were particularly interested in uh, the reasons why small parts of the state often function extremely well and delivering uh, on their mandate despite operating in very difficult contexts. This harks back to the developmental state experience in Southeast Asia and we wanted to see what was happening in, in contemporary sub-Saharan Africa. And Michael Roll's work was influential but Merrily Grindle's work was also influential here. Uh, the more you think about how states come about, uh, the more it's clear that maybe these small, high-performing pockets of effectiveness within the states, not full ministries, but quite small departments or even parts of departments, um, were actually the, the original building blocks of modern states. Uh, that um, Rich nations that are uh, developed now, uh, whether it's the UK, uh, Prussia over time, um, Japan, France, the United States and so on. Uh, these all started somewhere, often with the treasury or with the central bank or the military. Um, and so we wanted to put this existence of small uh, pockets of effectiveness into conversation with the wider literature on state building. Also maybe challenge the, the extent to which they were seen as somehow showing glimpses of a Bavarian future, of a rational bureaucratic order which African states would soon attain if they could only stop being so prey uh, to corruption. And we pointed out, as did Merrily, that pockets of effectiveness often operate on the lines and logics of patronage as, as much as meritocracy in terms of being at the behest of particular political leaders and using discretionary processes uh, through which appointments are made and decisions are made. So we were, we were really interested in this, this phenomenon of high performing uh, bureaucratic pockets of effectiveness and wanted to use them to explore deeper questions of what was happening around state building and rule in Africa. Uh, you'll be familiar with these types of questions that we've been asking across a, a whole range of policy domains within our work within ECID. Um, uh, does the political settlement uh, shape um, uh, this phenomenon in particular ways um, and what role do international and transnational factors play with a tilt towards policy findings. In terms of the types of political settlements, we worked in Rwanda and Uganda at different levels of concentrated political settlement using Tim's typology and three cases where power is more dispersed, uh, Ghana, Zambia and Kenya. And we did surveys in these countries to identify high performing agencies because there is no subnational index of state capacity. We had to ask uh, people and check that against objective performance indicators. And you probably won't be too surprised to find that we identified um, some traditional departments, usually budget departments in ministries of finance. And that's the case Badger will talk to um, in terms of um, uh, more autonomous agencies, central banks came through very strongly, and Maya will talk about the Bank of Zambia, and also revenue authorities, maybe a bit more contested, not high performing in all cases. Uh, and our Doug Afari will tell us why that's the case uh, with the uh, case of the Ghana uh, Revenue uh, Authority. 
Um, but we have work on nearly all of these agencies now up on our website with a few more papers coming through. Uh, and we've just heard that we have a book uh, contract forthcoming from OUP um, for the next uh, phase. So this is the range of uh, different agencies and countries that we looked at. So it gave us a good comparative basis on trying to understand uh, what was possible under different political settlement uh, conditions. Um, and what we'll do is run through three of these cases now and then come back to a couple of broader findings uh, before opening up. So uh, let's start uh, with Badri's work on Uganda. Badri, all yours. Thank you so much, Sam, for the generous introductions uh, for both uh, the researchers and the project. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from uh, Kampala. Um, as shown on this slide, uh, I'm focusing on the Ministry of Finance. And this work is a product of joint efforts between myself and uh, Professor Hickey. Um, I will start off by giving just brief highlights about the political context in Uganda, uh, noting uh, especially uh, two issues that, uh, well, as we have had one uh, president since 1986, uh, in actual sense, uh, the political settlement has uh, uh, varied considerably. Uh, between 1986 to 2001, we see a concentrated broad uh, type of political settlement, uh, which is characterized by a coherent uh, ruling coalition with the limited opposition. Now, from 2001 to present, uh, we have a political settlement that we can categorize as dispersed broad which is uh, characterized by powerful factions within the ruling coalition and increased political uh, competition between uh, the ruling party and opposition parties. Now, I would like to make two uh, observations here that these two variants uh, presented uh, President Museveni with the uh, two contrasting incentives. He took a longer term uh, horizon towards questions of economic development and institutional building during the first phase. And this was supported by donors. In contrast, since 2001, he's driven by a short-term imperative uh, of political survival. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, focusing on the Ministry of Finance, uh, we observe three uh, performance periods. And the uh, performance here is in relation to two uh, main indicators. One is the uh, ministry's control over the budget process, which is its core mandate, and then to the rates of economic growth. So uh, the period from 1990s to 2000 is a reform period uh, and uh, characterized by high performance. Then 2001 to 2012 with politicization and capture. Uh, and then from 2013 uh, to current is a period of uh, recovery amid this capture or what we call the dance of death. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes to try to put some meat on each of these uh, three phases. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in the reform and high performance period, we observe that it was an outcome of a three-way deal uh, on economic governance uh, between the ruler, who is the president, uh, technopoles and the donors. And this commenced with organizational reforms, including the merger of the Minister of Planning and that of the Minister of Finance, followed by technocrats from the Minister of Planning taking charge of the new ministry, and later in, the, in 1998, uh, the president appointed a powerful minister of finance, uh, Gerard Sendaula. So the ministry had the strong uh, political and the technical leadership and as reflected in that quote, that at the time, everyone was uh, reform minded. We enjoyed the positive political clout, uh, the political commitment from the president and the positive technical guidance from our bosses. A few more uh, reforms included the introduction of the cash budget, capacity building through donor support, and the meritocratic recruitment and staff advancement were emphasized. Consequently, uh, between 1992 and 2001, public expenditures were under control, and throughout this period, uh, inflation was in single digits, 
while economic growth uh, annually averaged uh, 7%. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, this period of politicization and capture uh, coinciding with the shifts in the political settlement in 2001, uh, the powerful permanent secretary Mutevire was transferred uh, to be the central bank governor. And the insiders informed us that uh, his transfer was politically motivated, apparently because he was trying to hold the line on public expenditures too strongly. Now, as uh, pointed out by one key informant, uh, there had been a major expansion of the budget, which should have led to political support, and M7 realized it hadn't. Economic policy made in a technocratic and impersonal manner would not work. He realized he had to use patronage, and this seemed to be associated with it. Uh, so, uh, associated with uh, the departure of Mutevire, uh, the finance minister also left in 2005. And this uh, brought on board uh, fiscal indiscipline. We observe a sharp rise in the number and level of supplementary expenditures, most of which uh, were going uh, to sectors closely associated uh, with the presidency ostensibly to fund regime maintaining activities. Mm -hmm. Also in 2000, uh, early 2000, we witnessed shifts in the government donor relationship whereby Uganda's dependence on foreign aid reduced uh, when new financial flows became available from the discoveries of oil in 2006. And also due to increased engagement of the non-traditional donor countries, particularly China. So as aid reduced, so as the ability of, uh, of, of donors to influence reforms and uh, defend allies in the government uh, against undue political interference. Uh, but we, in this period, we uh, especially uh, around 2011 during uh, the elections, that's when we actually experienced full-blown capture where supplementary expenditures reached uh, 30%. Inflation went out of control in 2011, which provoked uh, public outrage via the walk to work protests. Uh, Some next slide, please. So uh, this period, uh, which we term as a recovery amidst capture or dance of death, um, you know, it came after the 2011 elections, uh, when the crisis uh, in both political and economic terms reawakened the president and officials the minister of finance something needed to be done so as reflected in that quote from um from uh, a key informant i think there is some complacency that set in around 2012 were hit by scandals so we woke up uh we saw that people were hiding so the leadership had to to respond so the ministry initiated a series of reforms, including the Treasury Single Account and the Public Management Financial Act, which were uh, in the, uh, aimed at addressing abuse of supplementary budgets. In the 2011, the president appointed uh, a somewhat tougher uh, permanent secretary by the names of Keith Mukakanizi, uh, the gentleman in the middle there, with a clear mission uh, of clearing the name of the ministry to re-establish its hegemony in the government and restore donor confidence. Uh, however, uh, by the time of field work, it was evident, uh, it was evident that the reforms uh, had achieved the minimal results because the new permanent secretary was counterbalanced by two presidential royalists. Uh, the gentleman on the left, who is uh, Matia Kasaija, the Minister for Finance, and his deputy on the right. So observers note that efforts to stabilize public expenditure uh, via the Public Financial Management Act uh, were based on a deal whereby the presidency got a much larger share of the budget in advance. So the last slide, please. So uh, what explains uh, the performance trajectory just explained above? Uh, we group our fa the factors into two, uh, the proximate causes and the structural ones. So uh, among the proximate causes uh, is the variation in the level of presidential support and the protection offered to the ministry over time, 
which is reflected in the quality and the longevity of ministerial leadership, including political and the technical leaders. Uh, we also see that donor support matters. The ministry's performance declined uh, in the 2000s uh, when donors' influence over government, uh, government policy declined. Among the structural causes, uh, the political settlement dynamics with a noticeable shift in, uh, from dominant developmentalism of the 1990s to weak populism since 2001, the imperative to keep the conflictual ruling coalition together and the defeat rival political parties at elections compromised the stability and the time horizons of President Museveni. So in conclusion, uh, pockets of effectiveness in Uganda are clearly tools of patronage and political survival rather than part of a strategy of state building. Uh, thank you so much. Great job. Thanks very much, Badru. Uh, bang on time. Uh, so uh, let's move straight on to a different type of pocket of effectiveness, um, this time a central bank and a different country. Uh, Zambia, uh, all yours, Maya. Mm -hmm. Okay, good afternoon. Greetings from Lusaka. Uh, my co-author, Cesar Cello, is uh, doing some field work, so I'll be presenting uh, on my own. Um, so I'll be talking about the Bank of Zambia, which uh, is seen to be a pocket of effectiveness in Zambia. Well, we can take the next slide. So just after we finished uh, <laughs> publishing the paper in the asset working paper, uh, the governor of the central bank was uh, fired. So that was uh, caused a bit of upheaval in Zambia and also in thinking about uh, the work uh, that we're doing. It was a very controversial move. We had a, you know, a governor which was well respected from IMF World Bank and he was fired and replaced by a political ally of the president. So we, we're not sure how that's going to play out yet. Next slide. So just a quick overview of um, political settlement in Zambia, uh, where this first model um, broad-based, I mean, you, you know, the regime always has uh, appeased quite a number of uh, co factions within Zambia. It's also very concentrated. And we can see over time how it has uh, changed at the moment. It's a very fluid situation in the run-up to the next year elections, uh, but has a lot of signs of uh, becoming a little bit more authoritarian. Uh, Zambia's economy is very much influenced by large capital, foreign capital, the mining sector. It's also like Uganda seen the reduced influence of donors and civil society. Um, we've become a lower middle income country since 2012. Uh, so therefore we had more access to uh, private uh, loans, which saw an increase in debt. We have a high political turnover uh, since 1991, since the end of the reign of Kaunda. And even within the parties, there's quite a high turnover of factions. So it's a very restless kind of situation, especially in the last few years. The current ruling party is Patriotic Front and kind of a bit like UNIP, the ruling party in the 80s positions itself a little bit as a vanguard party. And this has had an impact on bureaucratic uh, performance. We have had a high turnover of ministers, permanent secretaries uh, and directors and a higher level of political interference. It's there have been fears of transfers over time international interest. Sometimes it made it also difficult to do interviews for this project. Uh, and state house is very central to decision making. That's in all political settlements throughout Zambia's history. That's been uh, a constant feature. Next. Uh, so while this had an impact on all the institution, Bank of Zambia seemed to be the exception. Uh, it's really managed to, uh, to insulate a lot from the recent, uh, well, from uh, political developments in the last uh, few decades. It was a original central bank which was functioning within a state-led economy uh, up to 1991. Uh, and so it was more kind of developmental in outlook. It had to be restructured in line with the structural adjustment programs of the 1990s. And so it became, uh, you know, what they call modern central bank, uh, which is functioning market economy. And slowly from the 90s, it's been building from a more autonomy based 
on legislation to more independence uh, based on the 2016 amended constitution uh, and was able to safeguard it from uh, interference. Next slide. So throughout, really from 2001 onwards, we see quite a bit of stability uh, in terms of price and financial stability. The 1990s were, were quite restless in those respects, but a foundation was built for, for that kind of price financial stability uh, from the 2000s onwards. It's really striking how steady they, they've been compared to Ministry of Finance and Zambia Revenue Authorities, whose function was known to be undermined, especially by the current ruling coalition. And we're showing here a Minister of Finance on the right, and on the left, it's the governor, well, the former governor of the Bank of Zambia up to August. And some of the indicators uh, we can see or why we explain why the Bank of Zambia seems quite strong. It was definitely strong leadership, uh, what we call technopoles. Kalialia, the governor, the former governor, was quite strong in uh, managing the relationship with State House. Of course, there was a discipline by international and regional banking regulations. Uh, it acted as a signaler to international financial markets which was important to attract foreign investments, which is a dominant feature of Zambia economy. It was also achieved by strengthening of legal framework. And then also the investment in the professionalization of the Bank of Zambia. And it happened to such an extent that even now uh, people are seconded from the Bank of Zambia to the Ministry of Finance um, to, to support uh, the ministry, even the current minister of finance actually is a former deputy governor of the Bank of Zambia, but so is the permanent secretary uh, and the head of uh, the debt management. So there's a very strong relationship there. The next one. And so, you know, we'll see from the figures about the stability and the inflation rate, exchange rates and the interest rates that kind of stabilized from the late 1990s. Uh, onwards. Inflation actually is, is really going up quite sharply this year. Next slide. So we kind of categorized the performance over time and I won't go into detail here, but it's basically looking at, you know, from 2001, it's been quite strong performance. From 2011, it's a little bit mixed. Uh, two different governors, one stronger than the other. Uh, there's been some pressure around elections on uh, Bank of Zambia policies. Um, but then we, we got a really strong leader in the, in the form of uh, Governor Kalialia. So overall price and financial stability was maintained and safeguards for independence, so we thought, uh, were strengthened. The next slide. So this is the, bank, the current governor of the Bank of Zambia who's dancing here. They call him Michael Jackson in social, uh, social media. Uh, he's a former deputy minister of finance. So the Zambia political settlement is based on a highly centralized executive powers, personality and quality of the leader and the chosen coalition matters. And we see the current shift uh, of kind of, some people say, you know, almost an attack on the Bank of Zambia is, is to some extent due, um, caused by regime survival ahead of the 2021 elections. Uh, PF is, is use, using a different types of way of, of trying to stay into power next year by being more dominant, especially in the urban areas, but also trying to deliver in a more clientelistic way and really needs the kind of support and cash from, from the central bank. So they've been trying to change the constitution, including reversing the independence of Bank of Zambia. But so far, the uh, members of parliament have been able to stop uh, those amendments. So again, parliament is holding on a little bit on that. And of course, then we saw the change of governor of the Bank of Zambia with a political alley. And as you can see, and to, to finalize this presentation is that, you know, it's something we haven't talked much about, but respectability is another thing that comes. Like judges in, in Zambia, you know, when you have a public function, like a governor or judges, you have to be seen to behaving in public. And I think this kind of picture shows that people had some hesitations about disappointment beyond the fact that uh, he's closely allied to the current president. That's where I leave it. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, you, you even got a little cheer for yourself there from the uh, the cockerels at that, that, that size. <laughs> <laughs> I like the, uh, the authentic uh, presence of Africa in the room. Uh, there we go. Okay, thank you, Maya. Um, I just I realised that we we I think uh, Badri yourself and probably Abdul Ghaffaru have all used this term technopoles that we may none of us may have defined yet. And just um, for the audience who are not familiar, um, this is a reference to either political leaders, ministers who have highly developed technical skills in their area. Um, a good example is actually from our Kenya case, uh, Mike Abaki, the president was a trained economist, or uh, it could be a technocrat, a permanent secretary, a governor, um, a director general of the revenue authority, who has also got great political skills and ability to navigate the political context. And, um, we kept tripping up over these characters as being critical to mediating in between the political settlement and the organization. So that's why we, we found the, the term technopole from the Latin American literature on state building very useful. Okay, so our final case, um, Abdul Ghaffar Abdullahi on uh, GRA. All yours, Abdul Ghaffar. Thanks very much, Sam, and good afternoon, everyone from Accra. Um, so my presentation focuses on tax revenue mobilization in Ghana and trying to see how and whether the political settlement um, theory that we deployed in this project can help explain variations in domestic revenue mobilization in the Ghanaian context. So Sam, please move to the introduction. So Ghana is generally considered as um, a low tax effort country with um, the tax to GDP ratio of 12% in 2018 as compared to an average of 18% for her peers. And, and this low effort, I mean, effort is reflected um, in, 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 in the persistent and growing gap between tax revenues and public expenditure, as you can see in the graph, in the graph displayed uh, below. Move on some, please. Okay, there are two key things to, um, to take note of in this, in this particular graph. I mean, we try to map up the political settlement dynamics with Ghana's um, tax to GDP ratios over time from 1970 to 2017. The first key point is the substantial variations that we can see in tax revenues over time with, with the worst performance in, in the 1970s, which marked a consistent decline um, in, 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 in performance. So there were substantial improvements in the in the in the 1980s under um, the PNDC ruling coalition led by Jerry Rawlings, during when power was highly concentrated. But with the best performance um, throughout Ghana's postcolonial history being recorded more recently in the in the early in the early 2000s, uh, more specifically from around 2001 to 2000. And five, during which um, the political settlement was characterized by uh, dispersed, dispersed power. So uh, the second key point, the second key point to note about this graph is the fact that <clears throat> the two particular periods of highly good performance that we identified in this study uh, were recorded or occurred under very different political settlement dynamics. The first being in the 80s when the, the, uh, when the political settlement was, was concentrated and the second being in the early 2000s when power was highly dispersed within the Ghanaian context. So I'm going to focus the rest of this presentation trying to explain these two periods of performance. Move on, Sam. <clears throat> there, is, there is broad consensus that the PNDC regime of the, two of the, of, of, of the 1980s um, had a much higher level of capacity in, ex in extracting uh, domestic revenues than any other government that uh, post-colonial Ghana had actually witnessed. And there's a World Bank evaluation report that actually concluded that the government of Ghana's performance in terms of re revenue mobilization actually did exceed what um, donor conditionalities even actually required. And, and much of this success was actually underpinned or facilitated by the concentration of power around the late Rawlings and a high degree of autonomy to uh, a newly established National Revenue Secretariat and its leader, uh, Ato Ahoy, who led the various, for, uh, the various reforms that contributed to the success. And these two key factors actually enabled the, the, the ruling coalition to broaden the tax base significantly to cover the informal sector for the, um, for the first time. Um, the state was able to utilize its coercive powers 
in improving tax compliance, particularly through the establishment of what they refer to as citizen vetting committees that have the responsibilities of identifying and punishing tax evaders and which contributed substantially to improvements in, in tax compliance. And, and, and a few hundreds of, of kind of staff, about 300 staff who were deemed to be non-performing and corrupt were sacked and, 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 and a whole lot of reforms were, were undertaken to help improve the conditions of service. And whilst at the same time, performance, staff performance was linked to the kind of incentives that, 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 that um, uh, were, were, were there. And all of this actually contributed to, 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 to the establishment of a performance-based organizational uh, culture that contributed to the improved performance that was recorded during this period. Next slide, Sam. This reformist zeal was sort of lost in the 1990s. I mean, once the country returned to multi-party democracy and the rules of the game were, were now changed to, 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 to help um, um, organize elections and power became much more dispersed. And you could see this loss of reformist zeal in several ways. The National uh, uh, Reform um, Secretariat actually lost the autonomy that it enjoyed in 1991, the, the, the particular retention scheme that became a major uh, source of incentive for, for, for officials was actually abolished in the 19, in the early 90s as well. Major tax reductions were recorded around election years in 1992, 1996, and particularly you, you had some major taxes that were actually being abolished entirely around, around election years. In 1995, when the government made a first attempt to introduce a VAT, it failed as a result of a lot of opposition, um, both from organized labor and, 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 and opposition political parties. And tax exemptions became much more widespread, um, which were partly linked to the problem of parties financing. So you saw a certain level of decline in the level of tax revenue mobilization around during this um, period in time. Next slide, Sam. The second period of impressive performance was recorded under a high degree of power dispersion and which uh, occurred under the President Kufour regime in the early 2000s, from 2001 to 2004, 2005, uh, thereabout. The MPP won the 2000 elections in, in, in a runoff and, and after several years of dominance of the PNDC, NDC administrations. What it means essentially is that the, the, the distribution of power did not change substantially around this time in the sense that power remained highly dispersed, which sort of kind of posed dangers for, 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 for various reforms under the previous ruling coalitions. But there emerged um, um, a pro reform coalition. Uh, which kind of provided a window of, of, of opportunity. And this was a coalition made up of citizens, donors, political elites, senior citizens, uh, senior bureaucrats, all playing different roles to help um, 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 help kind of uh, improve on revenue performance around this particular time. Next slide, Sam. On the part of citizens, there was so much goodwill for the uh, President Kufo regime in the early in the early 2000s, and which translated into minimal, very minimal resistance to the introduction of taxes, which actually enabled the uh, the Kufo led administration to adjust various existing taxes and raise uh, new ones altogether. And donor influence also played a substantial role, particularly in the form of HIPIC conditions, conditionalities associated with uh, the HIPIC initiative, but also some occasional kind of temporary waivers of conditions by the IMF, particularly around the 2004 elections, which enabled the government to maneuver and, 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 and impose certain taxes that and the previous government's um, uh, leaders didn't have the, the, the commitment to, to, to impose. There was also greater financing of revenue agencies by the Minister of Finance, led by a high-performing finance minister in the person of um, Honorable Osafu. Of, of, of Marfu. And, and, and this greater financing of, of, of revenue agencies actually contributed or became a major source of staff motivation um, that had begun to wane, particularly in the, 19, in the 1990s. What is interesting about this particular uh, case study is that the success story was very short lived because the various factors that actually drove these improvements in performance were short lived in themselves. Donor pressures began to, uh, to kind of wane um, shortly after uh, Ghana reached the Hippie completion point. And as a result of certain internal uh, intra, intra party factionalism, the, the, the finance minister who was also who played a central role in these improvements at this particular moment were removed 
uh, from, from, from office. So as a result of a combination of factors, I mean, the fact that uh, the goodwill that the regime enjoyed began to wane, the fact that hippie conditions um, uh, sort of ended, and the fact that the, uh, the finance minister, who was also very central in this level of performance, was removed, all contributed to, to actually uh, leading to a decline in performance uh, from 2006 onwards again. Final slide, Sam. So in conclusion, I mean, looking at these case studies and the overall paper or this case, this particular case study, we conclude that improved revenue performance can actually occur under different types of political settlements, where the political settlement is concentrated or, or dispersed. However, I mean, the successful reforms are more likely to be sustained in concentrated than in political settlements. And, and as in the case of the finance ministry case study that Badru uh, talked about, we found significant role um, to have been played by the nature of leadership, particularly the dominance of technopoles in both the, the at, at both at the organizational level, but also the mother ministry to which the revenue agencies actually report uh, and some critical role that donors or international support also played both in the 1980s and in the in the more recent period in the early 2000s under President Kufo. Some I'll leave it there. Great, excellent. Thanks, Abdul Ghaffari. Um, so I think across um, all of our cases, um, the findings really reflect where Abdul Ghaffari landed there, um, that the key thing which shaped bureaucratic performance across our countries, across our different types of organisation, uh, were political settlement dynamics. Um, in most contexts, competitive or factional pressures within ruling coalitions tended to undermine performance. And we found that bureau, uh, bureaucratic organisations could only prote be protected under highly competitive conditions for really brief periods where coalitions of politicians, technocrats with their international supporters could hold a line. And only in benign structural economic conditions, we only saw this in the mid 2000s where things were fairly good uh, for African countries in terms of macroeconomic conditions. And we found that Pockets could last for longer under more dominant settings. Um, but we did find caveats to that, that the concentration of power doesn't necessarily help. It can lead to a high degree of capriciousness, as Merrily warned us. And as we've seen in the case of Uganda, where Museveni now misuses uh, these pockets for regime maintenance rather than delivering on their mandates. But the interesting case that we haven't had time to look at today which was very different in our sample is Rwanda, where you had a higher level of power concentration than you do in Uganda. Um, but in fact, when you compare them over time, they were similar um, back in the 80s and early 1990s. But Uganda never really invested in widespread state building. It only ever did state building on the cheap via particular investments. Whereas what we saw in Rwanda, people found it much more difficult to identify um, pockets that stuck out as high performers compared to the norm. And our evidence there suggests that the reason why there's been a more broadly based investment in state building is really to do with the things that Tim pointed out in his earlier presentation in this webinar series uh, about the, the social foundations of the political settlements and the threat perceptions that elites operate under uh, and the sense that they, their legitimacy comes from building um, institutions for the long term that are able to de uh, deliver um, social goods across uh, different uh, ethnic groups, a particular concern for a minority government. And the final thing that um, has, has sort of been in all of the presentations is this highly significant role of international support. We didn't find any pockets of effectiveness emerging in contexts where there, were, there wasn't international support. But at the same time, we found that was often contested and it wasn't always the internationals that won out. And secondly, the influence of outside actors, most notably the IFIs, has been a profound misshaping of the state building project in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, whereby the bits of the state which have the capacity to deliver on their mandate are really the ones that are capable of delivering on a, a fairly neo, uh, a narrow neoliberal agenda of growth and macroeconomic stability. Um, and not the more muscular project of structural transformation, uh, which African leaders have increasingly turned to in the last decade, but really not had the levers to deliver on, uh, because those parts of the state, the ministries of trade, of commerce, of industry, of planning, 
were never built uh, and deliberately never built uh, during the phase, the historical phase we've been looking at. Uh, so that raises several critical problems for what this means for going forward for pockets of effectiveness as a as a policy agenda, which we think has you know, potential, but also pitfalls and would at least require a, a significant rebalancing of international support.